Good morning, Holy Trinity. Would you please stand as we begin worship this morning? Are you glad to be here this morning? Be in the house of the Lord this morning? All right, well, join us as we sing, I was glad. Good to be. Can you guys put your hands together like this?
church. How many of you have felt God this week in your week? Can I get an amen? Thank you. Amen. God's been with us this week, has, has God not? In Scripture, it says that God is Jehovah Nisi, our banner, and that God goes before us into battle. How many of you have fought a battle this week? <laughs> yes. We fight big and small battles, and God goes with us. Scripture promises us that God goes before us and declares victory over the battle before we even enter it. Church, put your hands up today if you believe that God has declared victory in your battles this week. Put your hands up and sing this with me. We're going to lift our banner high to God this week as we go from this place. Mercy on me, O oh God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great ca- compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion, it haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom, even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels, and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Look with favor on Zion and help her rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will again be sacrificed on your altar. church, as we look at what David is saying here in Psalm 51, we think about what emotions he might have been feeling as he wrote this. Ask him for a clean heart. He must have felt shame or guilt or something. Church, if you have any of those emotions, speak this out. You stood before creation. Eternity in your hand And you spoke the earth into motion My soul now understands You stood before my failure And carried the cross So what can we say? 
So what can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So I walk upon salvation. Your spirit. The one who gave it all 
standing here this morning, fully surrender to you. The things that we encounter throughout the week, God, are too big for us. The mountains that we have to move, the little molehills that we have to move, God, that feel so immense to us. The things that we feel guilty and shameful about, God, the things that we have done that may not have been the best, the people that we've hurt. God, you're in that with us. You sit with us. You're a loving God. You're just. You want us to move on. But you sit with us in that. Thank you for being with us in those situations throughout our week. God. Thank you for being with us here today. We ask that you would be among us this morning. I believe that you're already here. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we do have a children's program this morning. So your little ones can make their way back and meet their teachers at the doors. For the rest of us, come, give someone a hug, and ask them this. Titans or Chiefs? Packers! <laughs> she said directly into the mic. She said Packers. It's a squeeze, so you just squeeze it and pull it out. It's an arm swing. Let us prepare our hearts for the reading of the Holy Scripture. Scripture reading today is from Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. And don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. And if you are a thief, quit stealing. 
Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing you that you will be saved on the day of redemption. And do not and get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. This is the Word of God for the people of God. This dress is too long. There we go. All right. Well, good morning, Holy Trinity Community Church. I apologize for the lavalier action. I just, um, this uh, large dress is hard to navigate around. I don't know how you girls do it. Sorry, ladies. I want to welcome each and every one of you. I want to welcome... Mothers and fathers and grandparents and grandchildren and single people. I want to welcome people. I know this thing is being difficult. There we go. Oh, he's, uh, he's with the children's church. Sorry. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I probably will. All right. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you. Despite that unwelcome disturbance. That was fun. A year or two ago, that would have made me nervous, and now it's just fun. I'm growing. Thank you for helping me grow in doing this. This is my church family. I love you all. Um, for those of you who are visiting this morning, normally we have somebody a little more professional. And um, my name is Gavin, and that's who I am. I tried. I tried very hard. It just doesn't work. Good point. Very good point. So I'm going to try to start welcoming you again, and uh, hopefully nothing falls out. Uh, welcome to all who need hope or healing. Welcome to mothers, to fathers, to grandparents, grandchildren, aunts and uncles, and to single people. Welcome to people of all colors, cultures, and abilities. Welcome to people of all gender identities, sexual orientations, and political opinions. We would like to welcome believers, questioners, and questioning believers, for no matter who you are or where you are on your journey, you are welcome. I don't get sick of that welcome. I love hearing that every week. By the way, I had it explained to me recently that it's a good thing to say gender identities rather than genders because it signifies that you care about um, people's identity, how they feel on the inside, and it's just a more welcome and inclusive thing. And for anyone who is here visiting, we really do mean to welcome you. And if there is a way that we are not welcoming to whoever you are, please tell us how we can be, because we don't want to lose you or anyone like you. I like, thank you, I got some amens. 
I also thank the amen from over here from the, uh, from the scripture reading because when you feel it, you can amen. I love that. And I actually read a different translation of the, uh, of the scripture for today, and I'll get into it a little later. But listen to the subtle differences. It sounds so cool to hear the different, uh, the different ways that our anger is described. Um, anyway, I like that our welcome statement is almost as long now as the letters in the LGBTQIA2SP+, <laughs> which is also a mouthful, but I'm thankful for everyone included, so I'm just fine with that length. So last week, we started a sermon series on emotional and spiritual health. As I've spoken about before, I'm especially conscious of the effects of spiritual, mental, physical, and social health on each other. I think that we all know what it's like to have a physical pain that cause our, causes our mental health to suffer, or we have a spiritual tur turmoil because of a social situation. So as we're going through this series, I hope that you will all see how in turn our ability to share our lives with our community can affect our spiritual community, our spiritual relationship with God. Just as a disclaimer, I, like most people, am a hypocrite. I'm about to give some advice that I need to learn to follow. It's kind of like how you can always tell your friends, it's all going to be okay, honey. And you really think that all of your problems are just unsurmountable. So I'm about to tell you how to deal with an emotion with which I struggle. Today we're talking about anger, yay. <laughs> Fun story, um, this is a really weird thing to match the worship set with because, I mean, how do you say, hey, Aaron, um, What's a good Christian pop song that has to do with being really angry? Any? Are, are there any? No, guess not. So, um, you know, I was really happy that we found the stand because um, part of anger that I'm going to talk about is standing up for what you believe in, standing up when you should be angry. Bryce talked last week, among other things, about Jesus driving, driving people out of the temple and it continues to amaze me the way that modern-day churches keep doing the same thing that he was so angry at the Pharisees for doing. Now, I don't want you to think, because of that story, that commerce is just no part of the church, because that would be a lie. You are totally allowed to sell your cookies at a bake sale for fundraising, and you're totally allowed to donate a dollar to try your hand at drenching Bryce in the dunking booth or whatever. I have to get in one jab at him while he's gone, it's tradition. What the money changers were doing in the temple was taking advantage of the poor, naive, or the disenfranchised, making them think that they had to buy sacrifices at a ridiculous upcharge to buy their forgiveness from God. Part of the offense was performing sacrilege to the temple, and part of it was taking advantage of people in God's name in order to advance their own interests at the expense of others. And as JT pointed out to me at the millionth time that I was reading this to him, it's also the fact that they are putting a barrier between God's people and God. They're putting up one more step in between the two. And that broken relationship, that's where we should be angry. Now, I'm not gonna mention any names, but I have a few corporate fat cats and politicians that I would love to call out for stuff like this. If, just for example, not that anyone would ever do this, uh, but if some completely hypothetical person were to charge something ridiculous like $750 per daily pill for life-saving HIV medications, or if some, again, hypothetical, completely made-up person were to cut taxes for things like private jets and then uh, teachers couldn't get tax cuts for their class materials or something. You know, totes cray-cray stuff that ain't never happened in America. I think Jesus would love to just turn over a few of those pharmaceutical and political tables. Just my theory. Again, we welcome you no matter your political opinions. And if you have any problem, 
you may tell me how I'm wrong. I'm totally fine with that. I need a few friends to tell me how I'm wrong a lot of the time. I recognize that I'm a bit of an obnoxious social justice warrior at times, and I know that many times those who preach have this guilty tendency to paint God in our image rather than accepting all people as in God's image. But hear me out, I've got religio-socio-political propaganda. I think, I think that all types of people are made in God's image. All colors, cultures, gender identities, abilities, and orientations, all the people that I just welcome. So if we leave out any group of people, we are missing that part of God's image. And we may not see a full image of God in this life, but I think seeing God in every color, every ability, every type of person is important to getting the closest understanding of God that we can in this life. I think we distance ourselves from God by dehumanizing other people. Now, the kind of dehumanizing that happened to these people at the temple, that was not sudden. It crept in in a way that they didn't see coming. They weren't stupid people. They had people slowly take more and more from them over time. Sometimes we don't see what's being taken until it's too late to do much about it. We go on with our lives and we harden our hearts to what's happening and don't notice when another group of people is being taken advantage of. We can't take the time to dwell on every tragedy or else we will never stop crying. Whenever I think about the inability to stop crying, I think about myself in the situation of the way that we treat shootings in the US. I remember when I was growing up, the Columbine massacre happened, and everyone I knew cried, everyone was terrified, people were outraged, and it changed the way we do everything. The toys we were allowed to play with, the way we would go to school, the clothes we were allowed to wear, and you know, we put blame on everything other than the problem, but we didn't, we didn't want to accept we didn't want to accept, well, we couldn't do anything the same way anymore. It seems like school shootings barely make the news anymore. A year or two ago, there was a shooting in Antioch and Nashville in the same week. But neither of them got national press because of the shooting that happened in that casino in Las Vegas. What? I don't want to hear about a shooting and just casually go, oh, really, another one? Hmm. I want everyone to be angry. I want people to be terrified. I want something to be done. So maybe that's how we're supposed to be angry. We're supposed to be angry that people are getting killed. We are not supposed to use that as an excuse to kill more. But. I do think that there are some illegal arms dealers who need some serious tables turned over. A lot of people get angry at God when tragedy strikes. God, why would you allow my friend to die? Why do you allow people with cancer to suffer? I think it's natural to turn to, turn to someone who's all-powerful when there is suffering and ask, why allow this? And I think God understands our anger. I th don't think God is angry at us for being angry that others suffer. Job, for instance, got very angry at God. He even told his friends, if I could take God to court, I could win a suit against God. Arrogant, but okay. I think God could probably afford a better lawyer. I don't know. <laughs> but God still called Job a faithful man. We are allowed to be pretty mad that other people are hurting or being taken advantage of without losing our faith. I'm pretty sure God's angry that people are getting hurt, killed, taken advantage of, and suffering too. I want you to know that anger in itself is not a sin. Jesus got angry when people were persecuted and robbed. I think we should be too. 
But we also know that Corinthians, that love is slow to anger. Ooh, Gavin, that means we shouldn't be angry, doesn't it? No, I don't think so. I think that Jesus gave us several examples of how to keep your cool, not to paint Jesus as some long-haired liberal hippie who does goat yoga or something, because I don't want to paint him in my image. In Mark 3, Jesus heals a man with a withered hand, but it says they, the Pharisees, watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do harm or to do good on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Guys, these guys were watching Jesus to see if he would do something good just so they could say, hey, he worked on the Sabbath. So it seems that Jesus is angry that they are so caught up in the letter of the law that they put the command over another person's welfare. It seems like maybe the upholding of a command at the expense of the humanity of a child of God may be idolatry of a tradition over the image of God in another person. Just a theory, just Gavinology. I mean, if the greatest commandment is to love, love your God, love your neighbor, maybe the greater expression of love is the ultimate goal in any scriptural debate. Jesus asks his disciples in Matthew, if one of your sheep falls into a pit on the Sabbath, would you not work to pull it out? So my version of Ephesians says, putting away falsehood, let us all speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. We are members of one another. I had to say that twice. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Okay. I think it's really hard for us to be angry and not sin. We feel that someone is wrong, and we want them to have to hurt as a result. That's pretty messed up. But we do have a tendency to want those who make us angry to feel bad. It's really hard for me to pray for my enemies. I admit it. But hey, Nancy Pelosi says she does it, so I guess I should too. Not that we have any enemies in common. I'm not getting political up here, I promise. Just kidding. Psalm 7 has prayers against persecutors. Rise up, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake, O my Lord. You have appointed a judgment. Let the evil of the wicked come to an end. God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. Well, that's confusing. Proverbs 25 says, If your enemies are hungry, give them bread to eat. If they are thirsty, give them water to drink, for you will heap coals of fire on their heads, and the Lord will reward you. Well, I got a couple mixed messages from this. Am I supposed to pray for my enemies, serve my enemies, be angry at my oppressors, and pray that God has vengeance upon them all at the same time? Okay, I was told growing up that you're supposed to think, what would Jesus do? Which is always really funny to think about when you consider that chasing religious leaders out with a whip is an option now. By the way, please don't. Um, but I think that the mixed instruction we have on the subject of anger actually tells us a lot about the nature of God and the relationship God wants with us. Maybe even the relationship God wants us to have with each other. God exists beyond 
our understanding of space, time, ethics, physics, knowledge, and transcends all understanding we have of the divine in our little biological brains. So if God instructs that we should be angry without being vengeful, pray for our enemies without bowing to them, I should give it a try. So I looked up being angry without being vengeful on Bing, and I came up with a few articles on how to ang handle anger properly. Dude, I'm totally kidding. I Googled it. I'm a normal person. So one of the articles said, don't always just take the easy way out. You could scream at someone or throw that first punch, but if you don't react quickly, your point will be better taken. Wait, a normal reaction is to get in a fight? Where was I when God was handing out testosterone? Oh, the share concert, right. <laughs> I think that when anger becomes a sin is when we allow it to make us hurt someone else. A lot of the time, the consequences of losing control of our anger causes damage. That damage extends to those around us. It becomes cyclical, and we end up causing harm far greater than the normal reaction of the first offense. Anger is the result of anger a lot of the time. Wars start because someone did something that sparked a disproportionate reaction that caused another disproportionate chain reaction, and eventually, Joey chooses Pacey over Dawson, and it all hits the fan. I think most of the people at whom I'm angry were badly traumatized. People who hate gay people have been indo indoctrinated by an undeserving authority. People with biases have been attacked by someone or some institution and take that out on a demographic of people. They just feel like they have to lash out against it. But people who make me angry were lashing out in anger, in other words. So people have a trauma that has negatively affected their ability to have relationships with others. Their inability to love affects others and their spiritual health. How can you love God if you hate God's children? You harden your hearts to pain so that you can protect yourself. I talked about getting upset earlier over Columbine and how we just kind of stopped crying every time. I don't even remember the name of the California school that was uh, that had the shooting a month or two ago. I don't. I don't remember. There have been too many of them. We all remember the name of this famous one. People think that crying is a weakness, but tears are powerful. It takes strength to let your tears go with your friends. If your first reaction is to throw that first punch, that's a display of your strength, but it's a display of your emotional and spiritual weakness, and I would argue intellectual weakness. You didn't want to ask somebody what their trauma was. You weren't willing to accept them as a traumatized human being who needs someone to hear them. When you are angry, listen. When you are sad, share your tears with your church family. If you see people being hated in the name of God, turn over a table. Just be sure that you follow Jesus' command not to hurt under not to hurt other people, but to take your anger out on furniture. Is that why he became a carpenter? <laughs> you know when you were little and your parents made you hug your brother after a fight or they made you tell your sister you loved her after calling her names? Remember how you meant it? No? Okay. Well, I am definitely not going to sit, I don't know, Debbie and Alexander down and be like, tell your sister you loved her if they're in a fight. I'm, I'm not going to do that. But there is a way to do confrontation. And there is a time to cry. And there is a way to express your disdain without hate. It takes serious self-control. 
okay, I'm kind of beating the dead horse with this sibling rivalry and God is mom and dad metaphor thing, but hold on just another second. My mom has told me that she's only ever as happy as her least happy child. Can any parents out there confirm that for me? Is that a thing? Yeah. So if we are God's children, how much do you think it hurts God when we slam the door on our sister and lock the door? How much do you think it hurts when we tell our brother we hate him? But God wants a relationship with us and wants us to talk to God about those problems. Our heavenly mother is a fine mediator for sibling conflict. It just takes the patience to ask the questions, to pray for peace for our enemies, and to pray for God's intervention where we just don't know how to react to our anger. Will you pray with me? Our dear heavenly creator, our sustainer, our source of love, we thank you for all of your children. We ask you to give us patience when we don't understand them. We ask you to give us self-control when we want to lash out. God, we ask you for the self-control to say, what is it? What's wrong? We ask you to endow our hearts with the love that will ask our neighbor, where did this come from? How can we stop hating each other? How does this turn into love? God, give us that power, even when we think that looks weak. God, I pray that you will allow this community to confront our issues, to just love each other. It's in your name we pray. As we sing this next song, you can remain seated. Let the Lord, who is Lord of all, guide us as we go throughout this week.
the night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat with his disciples and he lifted the bread and he broke it saying, this is my body broken for you. And he took the wine and he poured it and said, this is my blood which has been shed for you. Remember me every time you eat of the bread or drink of the cup. It is the cup of the new covenant. For those of you who are visiting us, we do commune here by intinction, which means you will take one of these and you will dip it in the cup. And for those of you who have issues with gluten. We do have a gluten-free station up here so we don't have any cross-contamination. Yay for being inclusive, right? Uh, Lee, Debbie, who else wants to pray? Come on up. I saw a hand. Okay. <laughs> when you receive communion, these are the words you will hear. This is my body broken for you. You will dip it in the cup and you will hear, This is my blood shed for you. We have the, uh, our map up again this week, but we uh, started changing around the way that we're doing communion because of um, not having the center aisle anymore. So uh, no map? Cool. We'll improvise it. That seems to be what I'm having to do all, all day today just with all my technical issues and turning off my mic and everything. Come, be served, be filled with the Spirit of God.
and every one of you. I love you too. And I love all of you. I'm thankful for this community and that we do have the ability to confront our brothers and sisters and other siblings. I'm thankful that I just get to praise with all of you. I'd like to close out by everyone doing the Lord's Prayer. Do we have the offer? We do have the offering. That's okay. That's after announcements. Sorry, I'm I'm hearing voices all over. I, uh, oh, I'm not alone. Okay, good. Will you join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we invite our ushers to come <laughs> forward and do the offering. Thanks, <laughs> yeah. uh, If you're new with us, don't feel any obligation to give, but uh, we're just glad that you're here. But if you did come prepared to give, there are a number of different ways you can do that. You can place your gift in the basket as it comes down your row, or you can text HTCC Nashville to 77977 on your smart device to give now. Or you can give online on our website or at the community kiosk in the Welcome Center. Uh, we're doing the, the epiphany process. Uh, this year, HCC is embarking on a journey to call the epiphany process as a church. The epiphany process is designed to help us imagine and live in our new vision. During this process, we will try to find clarity on why we exist. Uh, we need a maximum of 30 people interested in the future of HTC, HTCC uh, to participate in an open forum and share the ways our church, church has excelled in meeting spiritual, missional, and relationship need, re, relational needs. Uh, 
This session will be guided by our interim conference minister, Char Birch. If, you're, if you care deeply about this church and would like to participate in the forum, please uh, consider signing up uh, today at hdcnashville.com slash events or at the community kiosk in the Welcome Center. The session will be held on Wednesday, 20, January 29th at 7 p.m. in Trinity Hall. Uh, we can only have a maximum of people, 30 people, and so the spots will fill up fast, so please sign up today. Uh, one of our amazing ministries here is Room of the Inn. Uh, we are always looking for volunteers to help out each weekend at the church, and we specifically still have some spots available for the last two weekends in January. Please come help us change the lives of these women by signing up today at the community kiosk in the Welcome Center. There's a theme here. Uh, and as you can see today, our choir is back up again this year. And we're, yeah, it was, uh, we're preparing for our Easter service. It says here, I lead a personal testimony on how choir has impacted your life. So I guess I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about um, choir. Choir is honestly one of the big reasons I fell in love with being at this church. Um, we've talked about previously a church that we're a community of small groups here, and choir is one that we have so much love for each other, and we have so much fun, uh, and we learn and we grow so much together. Uh, and we would love to have every single one of you that want to be a part of us, join us. You see us here up on stage worshiping, but we worship and uh, have fun together just as much on Thursday nights. So please, if you have an inkling ability to hold a note, we would love to have you join us. <laughs> we, can, we can foster a talent. What we need is passion and people to come and sing with us. Uh, so you are welcome to join us on Thursday nights. We meet at 6.30 over in Trinity Hall. Uh, uh, and that being said, this is just a few of our important announcements here at the church. Uh, there's always exciting things happening here. Uh, to see everything, you can go to the website, hucnashville.com slash events, or you can go out to the community kiosk. Uh, I'll be out there after uh, church to help out. Thank you. Am I on? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I would like to charge each of you to... Go and confront and love and turn over some tables. Not this one. This one's a little sacred, but <laughs> turn over some tables. Ask why, but go love. Go love all of God's children. Go in peace to love and serve.